Hi, everybody. Hello. Yeah, let's wait a few more seconds. More people joining us. So I know there was a mistake, and some of you might think that it's not going to be in Russian, but it's going to be in English. So if you want to change, that's your last chance. OK, so good afternoon. Um, it's my first time in Kyiv, so it looks great here. And today, you'll get introduced to Scala. Um, Scala, it's an awesome language, and you should really listen carefully today, because this day today might change your career. Probably, you'll want to, you will think to yourself, wow, how I did write Java all these years. And even if you won't move to Scala, probably you might change your, the way you write software. Um, just to know who here played with Scala, anybody tried? OK, quite a few. Nice. Uh, so a bit about myself. My name is Maxim Novak. I'm in the software industry for around uh, nine years. And with Wix, uh, around three years. And since, since then, I write Scala. And I really like it. By the way, we have a new office here in Kyiv. So if anyone wants to work with new interesting technologies, talk to me, or we have a booth on the third floor. So today I'll show you, share you with you my experience with Scala and why I think it's so great language. So what is Scala? And some call it is the better Java. Why? Scala. It's another language that compiles to JVM bytecode. But it's a modern language with a lot of features. And on the other hand, we have all the benefits from our loved JVM, as most of you know. And I believe that by the end of this session, I will convert you to Scala. This session will have two parts. In the first part, I will show you why you want it, why it's so good for you. In the second part, I will give you tips and show you how you move easily from any JVM language or any language to Scala. So of course, it have a lot of features. So here I chose uh, some basic, some simple concepts that have big impact for you. Of course, it have much more. And in most of this uh, talk, I'll give Java example, and then I'll show you how to do the same thing in Scala. You'll be amazed. So the first thing I want to, to talk to you today is conciseness. Java is a great language, seriously, but it has a lot, tons of boilerplate, a lot of ceremony. So we'll start with this example. We can see a checkout class here. It's in Java 7. By the way, I'm doing a little research. Who here uses Java 8? So I think it's around 60%, 70%. So this is Java 7. Let's do it with Java 8. Um, as you can see, the difference is not dramatic. Many people said, OK, we have Java 8. We don't need Scala anymore, because we have lambdas now. We have optionals. But I'll show you today that we have much more in Scala. And the thing that Java introduced these features it just validates that Scala is going the right way. So let's start convert this class. Pretty simple. Everybody in this room can understand what it does. Let's convert it to Scala. So the first thing that in uh, Java, uh, classes by default are uh, private, uh, are, uh, pri package private. And we find ourselves adding public every time to many classes. So in Scala, it's the default. Another thing, the um, semicolon. We used to do it, and it looks normal to all of us. But actually, we don't really need it. In Scala, the com compiler is smart enough to understand that at the end of the line, it uses a technique um, called look-ahead technique, and it can understand it, so we can remove it. Next thing, we have a tax field and a constructor that assigns the value from the constructor to the tax field, and we do it all the time. Uh, we write this boilerplate over and over again. We can just remove it. This is how we do it in Scala. We just said that we want tax, and it's double as a class field. The next thing, return. 
we don't need it. In Scala, the last line is the return value of the function. So we can remove it. Anyway, it's not so good practice to return in the middle of the function. Now, this is how we define methods in, um, in uh, Java. And we have two things here. One is the final. It's, uh, it's bad practice to re resign the value of the parameter, right? We even get a um, compilation warning in Java. So we use final. But why do you use final every time when it can be the default? So in Scala, every function parameter is final. So this is how it looks in Scala. Note that also we converted the order between the, the name of the variable and the type. I'll talk a bit uh, later about this more, why we do it. It's OK, we'll get to it later. Now, the return type of a function. So if we read the code here, we see products, and then we map them to doubles, and we sum. So we know that the sum is double, and then we multiply it by a tax, which is also a double. So we know that the result here is a double, right? So the compiler also can understand it. So we don't need this. Now, a bit more boilerplate is the stream and the map to double, so we are lucky that it's a double here, right, the price, because if it was like a currency or something else, it would, would be harder for us. So we don't really need it. So this is how it looks in Scala. Yes, you can say, wow. So if uh, you're not sure what it does, so we have a sequence, it's like a list in, um, in Java, so we have the products, we map them to the, their price, and then we sum them. Let's see it side by side with the Java code. OK, and this code does exactly the same. Exactly. It's funny that even if I compare it to Java Hello World, it's even shorter. And it actually does something. So now, after we saw this cool stuff of consensus, let's move to something else, immutability by default. By default. So usually, imperative languages like Java, doing a computation by taking some variable and iterate and change it over time. In functional programmer, programming languages, usually you have immutable state and uh, pure functions. It means that you don't um, have state and don't uh, change variables. Uh, in many cases, the functional way is cleaner. It's easier to test. It's easier to reason about. And it's thread safe. Um, so yes, you can write immutable code in Java as well. But in Scala, it's much easier. This is a quote by Martin Odersky, the author of Scala. As you can see, if the author of the language um, encourage you to use immutable, you can do it much easier. And this is the default. So all the other code base that you use, other libraries, are most of them immutable by default. So if some of you are still not sure why mutability is not such a good idea, I have a small example for you. So we have this code. We have a new hash set. We create a date, add this date to the set. We just change the time of the date, and then we print um, we ask the set if it contains the date. Now, who thinks that this will print true? OK, two people, then two more. OK, and who thinks that it will print false? OK, most of you don't think. Uh, so I'll tell you. So pro probably it will be false. I'll show you why. So we create a hash so set. The way it works, as probably all of you know, it has hash code and the bucket of objects. Uh, for simplicity, the hash code here is the same as the date and not the hash function. Then we create a date. We put it here in number two, right? Then we change the, um, the date to four. And in date, the get hash code is implemented correctly. So the hash code is according to the date. So now when I do set contains date, I go to the date, ask you, what is your hash code? The date said, my hash code is 4. And then the set go to 4, 
and look if there is something there. There is nothing. So it's going to be false. Um, a good blog post that I recommend to read anyway, to have a lot of examples, this is just one of them. So after we understood this, let's talk about domain objects. Um, we do it all the time, right? We, need, we have a product, so we write an object for this. So we write getters, setters. Actually, we said immutability is not so good, so we remove the setters. But we need to string, we need equals, and we need hash code, like we saw before. Now, anyone here think that this is a reasonable amount of code for what we get here? No one. This is good. I like this audience. Do you want it to be shorter? Yes. So this is how it looks in Scala. Just one line of code. You just add the word case before the class. And you get all what we saw before, and even more. What else do you get? Uh, just a second. Yeah. Um, probably some of you say, OK, OK, all this code that we saw before, nobody actually writes it, right? The IDE generates this for us. We do a few clicks, and we have all this class with the getters, setters, everything for us. So OK, we have a complicated language. Now we need a complicated IDE to manage this language. And this many researchers show that we read code much more than we write code. So even if the IDE generates the code for us, we need to read it over and over again. So here, the compiler does it for us. So it's much easier to read the code. What else do we get? We can satiate such object without the new keyword, which is also removes boilerplate. And it's nice that because we can um, give it as, to the function, as a function. As I said, it's immutable. So if you want to, we can't change the value. But most of our pro programs do stuff that change. So what we do, we can copy. We get the copy function on every case class. So we just say what we want to change, and we get a new object, a mutable object, with the, that value different. Um, next thing is static type inference. As we saw before, in Scala, we don't need to define the types. The compiler can understand it itself. But it's statically typed. So if I try to put an int to a string, I get a compilation error. Okay, Same for methods. It will not work. Same for uh, functions like here. By convention, for public functions, we do add the, um, the type. And for private, not. Because public methods, we do want the API to stay. So if I change from int to double or whatever, I want to have a compilation error. But for private methods, we know that we use it so it will break anyway. Uh, let's see some more constructs that help us to make our code nicer. So first thing is use types to understand functions. In this Java example, we have the divide one by function. Now, from this function, we don't know what's the result of this method call, divide one by zero, uh, divide one by zero, right? So to know what's the, what's the result here, we can read the documentation, maybe write some tests. But we also need to think about the, the in zero, this is undefined. So, so we have multiple options, right? It can be null, arithmetic exception, not a number. So it's make in making it hard for us to work with it. In Scala, we have a way to, d to show this by the type system. So we have a type called option, which is a container type. It can be none, which means it's empty, or it can be sum of an object, means that there is a value. So in our case, this, this will look like this in the Scala. We'll use option of double, and option uh, divide one by zero will be none, divide one by uh, two will be half, sum of half. So what else we get with this option? We can work with it in imperative style. Usually we don't do it, but some people that just beginning to move like to work this way. So we say we have the result, and then we want half of the result. So it's a result. Is, if it's defined, then the, uh, divided by 2. But then we don't know what to do on the else case, right? We, we keep it null or whatever. So the functional style will look like this. Use result.map 
So that map means that if there is a value, it will run the function, and if no, it will stay none. Okay, you can write it even shorter this way. Uh, another good is that we get with this option is the default value. So of course you have an option, get or else, something else. We can uh, concat fallbacks, so first fallback, second, and we can continue with this. So in the end, it will be the first that matches. Um, we have a problem with working with the Java APIs because we still can get nulls. So all you need to do is wrap them with option. When I work with a, a Java API, when I'm not sure about the nulls, I just wrap it with option, and I never see null pointer exceptions again. Seriously, I didn't saw like a few years a null pointer exception, and it's really cool. Now, there's something called try, which is very similar, but it can be a success with a result or a failure with the throwable. I'm not going to talk about it today because it's very similar to option. Let's see. I'm sure many of you wrote this kind of code. Right? Because we have a product which might be null, and it have a photo which might be null, and the URL in the photo might be null. So we do this ugly stuff in Java. I'm sure anyone here wrote this kind of code, at least once. So how it will look in Scala? We'll change a bit the signatures. So if it can be null, it will be an option. And then we'll do something called for comprehension. So what it does here, in any stage, if there is none, it will stop the execution and will return none, right? So the product opt, if there is something, it will go to the product variable. Now, then we go to the next line. If the product.photo is none, it will stop. If there is something, it will go to the photo, and etc. So maybe it's a bit uh, confusing now because you see it first time, but just from looking at it, it looks much clearer. So with a little bit of practice, you get used to it, and it's much easier. Powerful pa pa pattern matching. Uh, so pattern matching is something uh, that's very common in functional languages. It's similar to switch case, but much more powerful. Let's have a look at some examples. So we have um, va uh, value x. Any, it's like uh, the upper type for everything in uh, Scala. And this is syntax. We, we can match on it. So we can match. This is like a switch case, right? So if it's 1, it will uh, return this string. If it's the string 1, it can know. So it can also match on the type, also on the value. Um, we can match only on the type. So if it's a Boolean, we, by the way, we extract, we do the um, like um, casting. It, it already does the casting for us. So it's a Boolean. We can have guards. So it already does the casting, and we have another additional um, uh, condition. If we don't care about the value, but we care about the type, we have a semantic way to show it. We can have like union of types, and we can have a default um, default value. This also works for case classes. Remember case classes that we spoke about it before. So every case class automatically have something called an extractor. So I can match on any object, and then if it's a product and the price is zero, and I show that I don't care about the name, I print this free. I don't care. Otherwise, it extracts the name on the price, so I don't need to do product.name to the price and extract it all the time. It does the extraction for me. So it's very nice. Also, for classes that are not case classes, we can write custom extractors. This example from, if you work with, for example, with Java net URL, and you want to match on the protocol, you can write very easily an extractor. I'm not going to go into the details, but just to show you that it's pretty short. And then you can do something like this. By the way, the pattern matching works uh, line by line, so the first match, it, uh, it will stop. Next thing is parameters. In Java, say, let's look at the example again. 
We have a database connection, right? It gets uh, host, port, and credentials. We start using this, and uh, we understand that usually the port is the same port, so we add this constructor. Then we understand that usually the host is in most cases local host, so we add this constructor, right? So, and so on, we add uh, more and more constructors, and it's messy. So in Java, we do have a solution for it. It's called the builder pattern, right? But there are two problems with it. First is that I need to know that there is a builder. And second, it's, uh, again, a lot of code to write for this. In Scala, we can use just something called default parameters. So we just uh, set the default parameters here, and it just works. So we can use it um, by order. So this one will go to the host. And we can use it by name. So this one will go to the port. Another, another benefit of um, named parameters is this. Anyone know what this true means? OK, that's what I thought. So again, in Java, there is a solution for this. You do this, right? But in Scala, you don't need to. It will look like this. We use it a lot for Booleans or integers that it's not clear. So we make this way the code much more readable. Uh, strings. All of us use strings. Some of us use it a lot. So in, in Java, we have this uh, very antique way, I would call it, of uh, putting uh, variables into the string. In Scala, it's much easier. We just add the S word. This means string interpolation. And now we can use any variable from here with the dollar. It will be this. Also, if we want quotes, we don't need to escape them anymore. We just use three quotes, and we can use quotes. And it even works for, works for multiline. So you can write JSON like this without all the pluses in the end of the line. OK. Let's talk about DSLs. So to, to talk about DSLs, I start with a few other building blocks. Start with implicit classes. It's also called the extension methods. So this is basically a way of the language to let you extend existing classes. This is a code from the Java compiler source code. So they apparently um, they had a lot of uh, checks of on a file if it's a class. So they just added is class to a file. So now when you use a file, you can just call the is class method on it. Now this is a bit strange because you worked with the file for like 10 years, and you know there is no is class method. So it looks, looks uh, weird in the code. So the, uh, the ID helps us a little bit with it. So you see this underline? This way, the um, ID tells us it's not on this class. It's implicit. You can even uh, do some shortcut, and it will show you that it comes from file ops, where this, and you click Enter, you go to the source code. The same way. We can do something like a 1, 2, 10. And as a result, we get something called range. Remember this example, we'll get back to it. Something else we have in Scala is infix notation. In Java, we can use this code. And we can also use this code. Now, actually, when you think about it, plus is a function, is also a method on the string. And you can, uh, it looks very natural to us. In Java, they solve it by the, the, the compiler know that plus works on string. It converts it to string builder and runs the append method. But in Scala, we can use this way of calling functions for any function, for example, like this. So for any, uh, we can remove the dot and the parentheses. It will just work. But why is it good for us, right? Why do we not want this? Sometimes it's nice, like the plus. Also, we can write stuff like this. OK, so the for loop will look like this in Scala. Moreover, we can build nice DSLs. So here is the example of a specs to library. It's a library for testing in Scala. And this way, I, used, I add methods to strings 
and make the um, make a DSL that let me write tests and describe better what's going on here. When I run, uh, now what happened here is again we don't need the dots and we don't need the all the methods were added. And when we run the tests, we even we don't see method names here. We see the text that we that describes the test, which is nice. Now, I like Scala, but I have proofs that I'm not the only one. This is a Stack Overflow a survey from last year, from 2016. And it shows that Scala is the most beloved language from the JVM languages. And pretty high in the overall. And also the most paid um, the one above is, is it's actually the same, 125 and Spark. The numbers talk about the US, so I'm not sure about uh, Ukraine, but I guess like at least the ranking similar. Um, so I hope you're all convinced. You're ready to move. So let's see how we do it. So tomorrow, no, tomorrow is a conference. Next day you come to work and you come to your team. You say, look, I've been at this awesome talk and I heard about Scala. It looks great. Instead of uh, just being busy typing, we can be actually busy implementing our business. Let's try it. So first of all, you should know that you're not alone. Many big companies and also small companies already use it in production. In weeks, uh, most of our backend is in uh, Scala. A few years already, and it works great. And the community is growing all the time. So, you want to start? I guess everybody here work on the JVM, right? So, the start is easy because you already have the tooling. You have the build tools. It's already, the runtime is already on your production servers. Um, you, your benchmarking tools that you're used to will work. Most of the tooling will work. You're familiar with it. The next thing, all the libraries. All the JVM libraries are completely interoperable. So you can just uh, import, um, like add a dependency to any JVM library, it'll just work, just method call. The next thing is that it's combination of object-oriented programming languages, language and functional. So we can start um, object-oriented like you used to and gradually move to a more functional style and find your style and use the best tool for any job you're doing. Um, by the way, you can have in the same project Java classes and Scala classes. So if you, when you start moving, now, let's talk about some caveats. There are some things that are less good, so I just want you to know about them. So, one criticism about Scala that it gives too much freedom to a developer. So, it's very easy to write code that it's hard to read later. Now, and I saw a few developers that just start with Scala, so they go crazy, go like this, use crazy stuff, then they understand that it's insane, and then go to normal. So when you're in this normal, you can be much more productive, and your code can be very readable. So you need to be responsible, not just use any feature you know from Scala anywhere. A good principle anyway, there is a good blog post, uh, but it's good to read it anyway. It's called the um, least powerful tool. So it basically tells you you have a task, just use the least, uh, least powerful tool that can do this task. Your life will be much easier. Slow compilation time. The Scala compiler is much smarter than other compilers, like we saw. So it takes time to do this. Uh, it's improving all the time, but still it's slower than Java. By the way, in Wix, the way to mitigate it is we work with microservices, so when the services are small, it's not that a big deal. For big applications, it can be not so nice. 
less tooling, like I said, most of the tooling will work, but for example, the IDE is less powerful than Java, the all the refactoring that you used to, some of it will work, some of it not. Also, it's not uh, related to tooling, but the stack traces mi might look a bit weird because for any function, it makes anonymous classes and functions. And last thing is recruiting. So yes, there are no many experienced Scala developers. And it's hard to find the one that there are. But in weeks, we are aiming to get like to recruit uh, good software engineers, not a developer of a specific language. So basically, it's actually a good filter for us that if somebody is willing to learn something new and interested in that stuff, so we want him also. I already said before that we are hiring, right? We have an office here in Kiev. <laughs> Um, of course, it needs a lot of mentoring and education in the beginning. Um, so to help the, uh, the new engineer to start with it. Actually, I think we're going to uh, finish before time. We are going quick. <laughs> or we have a lot of time for questions. So how you how you move uh, from Java to Scala. First of all, if you're not confident enough that you want to do this move, you can start writing your tests, right? So many times it's easier to convince the management because they don't want this uh, to go crazy and start to use some unknown stuff. So you start with tests. That way you learn the language and you don't affect the production. Next thing is convert class by class. As I said before, uh, Java classes can live together with Scala classes. So, and guess what? The IDE can even do this for you. You see this? <laughs> so, of course, it will work it, it will convert it to something that we call Jala. It's um, Scala syntax, but Java Java way. But it works, so it com converted it to Java. Then you just you, you compile it, you run your test, you see that everything is fine, and then you start refactoring. But this is a good way to start. Now um, Scala also have. Uh, different collections library. Like you saw before, I used sequence instead of the list. So uh, we have uh, converters classes in Scala that will help us uh, remove the friction and help us uh, use Java and the Scala collections. Next thing is bin property annotation. Some libraries or many libraries in Java Assume that your class will have getters and setters, right? Because that's the way Java works. But you are want to write case classes, right? You don't want to write getters and setters. So if you use a library like, I don't know, serialization library that need this stuff, all you need to do is you can add the bin property annotation on the class, and the compiler will generate getters and setters, so any JVM, library, framework, whatever can use it. Uh, now, last tip is to preserve the git history. If you just change the file name and change the code, you lose all your history. You don't want this to happen, right? So there is a trick. You first change the file name without changing the code and commit. I know it won't compile, but you commit. Then you change the code. This way, because if you change the file name and the code, it's a too big gap for git. I'm not sure, for sure about other um, source controls. But for Git, it's too big gap. So if you do it in two steps, you will have all the history of the file back to the um, Java code. Um, now, of course, we covered. Um, of course, we covered um, just a little bit of uh, of what Scala has to offer. If you want to learn more, uh, here are a few. Um, re, uh, like introduction stuff, and also some advanced topics that you might want to learn about. 
And uh, as I said, we finished a bit five minutes earlier, so we have extra time for questions. Thank you for the uh, presentation. And uh, the question is about reactive libraries. Is there something in Scala like Java Project React or something like that? Reactive libraries? Yeah. There, yeah. So um, I'm not using such libraries, but I know that there is Scala Rex, I think. And uh, there are a lot of also uh, the famous uh, actor library, which is kind of a reactive library, Akka. So there are plenty of them. Do they really use in production? I didn't use any of them, but uh, I know other companies that use Akka, for example. Okay, and the uh, I'll give up microphone. Just one more question. Yeah, we have uh, extra time, so it's fine. Okay, uh, mm, I believe that if you write in Scala, your approach to design should change. So, is there some different patterns, design patterns, or ways or best practices when you're writing Scala because it's kind of functional language? Yeah. So. It's a combination of object-oriented and functional. So, of course, uh, it changes. So you use the benefit of both wor worlds. Uh, some people write uh, like functional, like Haskell. We don't do it at Wix. We use practical Scala, what we call. Um, so, of course, like some of the stuff I showed, they use, uh, immu it's immutable by default. Um, so there are many different stuff, and with the time you, you learn to like enjoy both of the worlds of functional and object oriented. Thank you. Um, the question about implicit. So you showed us how to, for example, to extend the functionality mm -hmm. of existing class. Yes. So we uh, like kind of cast one object to another class, which has uh, additional method we are going to use. What if uh, we have the same object, but we use a, a lot of new uh, methods we uh, have in implicit cast casting? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to do the cast just once, or maybe compiler is smart enough to do it once just for performance reason? I'm not sure I understood your question. Uh, so let's say we have integer, mm -hmm. but we want to add some functionality to, yeah. to integer, like Anything. So yeah. we uh, write implicit casting to yeah. our new. Uh, yeah, like okay. So we have had some example of the file. Yeah. And we have file ops which adds the is class. Right. right. But okay. maybe I you, I take uh, that object and I use a lot of methods uh, that we added, mm -hmm. but it means that implicit casting will uh, work for each line I call mm -hmm. uh, the method. Yeah. Is there a way just to do that once, uh, to cast once for performance? Uh, no, but I believe that the JVM will optimize this. If you call this a lot, so the JVM will optimize. So I don't see any performance. Um, I'm not worrying about performance here. By the way, it's not a cast. It's a wrapper class around what uh, is built behind. That uh, method each time you 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 are calling um, yeah. like new new stuff we add yeah and another question you said in Wix.com the most of your backend is uh, written in Scala mm -hmm. did you start with Scala from the beginning or you had to re no so Wix uh, started more than ten years ago with Java and moved to Scala around four years ago around four years ago we started to move and most of our backend is Scala now. Uh, can, you say, can you say, for example, uh, when Scala is better than Java? Some maybe cases, real examples, and when Java is better than Scala? Well, Some projects maybe in general. Uh, you know, you can do the same things with both languages, general purpose language, but I think that the big benefit of Scala that it uh, encourages you to a better practices like immutability, like functional programming, and it's much more concise. So you type much less, and you you get more like much readable code. 
Uh, and what about uh, performance and some maybe other disadvantages? So performance, it's compiled to a JVM bytecode, so the runtime doesn't really know that it's Scala. And uh, b uh, some people worry about uh, the many objects that we create because uh, it's immutable by default. But this is also not a problem because all these pro pro um, objects are short-lived. So actually, the garbage collection removes them very fast. And th there have been many researches about performance uh, comparing Java to Scala. And they're about the same for most tasks. Any questions? Anyone else? Yeah, over there. Uh, hi. And the hi. question is, uh, if we have uh, in uh, one project Scala and Java code, how to compile it together? It works perfectly fine. Uh, the Java compiler doesn't know. Uh, no, you, it's, in the, it's in a, you know, you can tell it to uh, star.java, star.scala. So the, the name of the file, of course. Uh, okay, if uh, Java code has references to Scala classes, uh, and Java compile, compiler... Yeah, it's not a problem. Because well, it compiled to a Java JVM bytecode, and it works. Okay. You can, like, if you want, you can just uh, change one class to Scala. You need to add a Scala compiler, of course, to compile it. It will work. Uh, so at first we compile Scala code and then Java? Um, I don't think it matters because you compile each class separately in the JVM, right? And the link is dynamic. Okay. I'm not sure, but it works for sure. Uh, hi. Um, I ask probably the last question uh, here. Um, my question is, uh, what is the difference and main purpose of uh, types null, nil, nothing, and none in Scala? <laughs> and why, <laughs> why, so why there are so many? No. OK, so uh, null, we don't use null in Scala. None is in, like. In case of optional. Hmm? In case of optional. Yeah, we, we, we don't use null. Uh, none, like we showed before, it's uh, in case of optional. We have none and some. Nil is actually an empty sequence. And there was another one that you asked about? Nothing. nothing? OK, nothing. If you have a method that uh, never returns, like L always throws an exception, so the return type will be nothing. Something going wrong. And in case if all works fine and nothing to return its unit. Yeah, if a, if a function doesn't like the return void in Scala in Java, so it's unit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So nothing. Just say that it never returns, like mm -hmm. a semantic way. It can be unit as well, but uh, usually we use nothing. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. If you have any more questions, you can see me around. I'm walking around or in the Wix booth. Thank you.